it is absolutely fascinating that, that um, particularly when you when you read um, when, and when you learn about the theories of quantum mechanics and special theory of relativity of Einstein's and general theory and later on quantum field theory and all that, it is amazing how you can start with a very simple, reasonable assumptions about the universe or matter and f interactions. And just by using mathematics, you can pretty much explain everything about the inanimate uh, universe. It doesn't say anything about life and consciousness, and that's, of course, the next frontier. But it is absolutely stunning how much you can deduce just from a few assumptions and, a, and clever use of mathematics, and that has always fascinated me mm. and continues to fascinate me. So as I was learning about these subjects, one of the things that crossed my mind was, um, uh, how does the brain work, you know, in, in two ways. One is, how does it discover all these things? How does the human brain, now obviously these were discovered by gifted brains, such as yeah, Einstein, of course, and then Newton, and then a whole bunch of other people who, you know, discovered quantum mechanics. So. How do these discoveries happen? And secondly, how does the brain itself work? What would be the physics, as it were, mm -hmm. of, of the brain? And uh, what would be a mathematical framework that would model a brain successfully? And so that's a problem I've been interested for 50 years now, more than 50 years, since my undergraduate work in ASITIC, you know, across the road from here. So. Um, and, 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 you know, so after I did thermodynamics at, uh, statistical thermodynamics at uh, Cornell with Keith Gubbins, uh, this question came back again, you know, uh, statistical mechanics is the intellectual framework for explaining the collective behavior of millions of agents, actually, you know, trillions of agents. Um, but the agents are not um, uh, smart in the sense they don't make decisions uh, like molecules, for example. They are merely prisoners of Newton's laws. They simply follow F equals MA. And so they go, go and, and if you take a gas molecule in a container, a molecule goes and bumps against the wall and container wall, and it doesn't complain, saying, oh, that hurt and I'm not doing that again. Mm. It'll come back and bounce again. You know, they simply follow F equals MA. And the description of that, mathematical description of that is statistical mechanic. Mm. So I asked myself the question, so what would StatMec look like if the individual agents were goal-driven? That mm. is, they go and bump against and say, no, this, is, this hurts, I don't like it, I don't, I'm gonna do something else. So what would StatMec look like for millions of interacting agents where the agents are pursuing goals? I thought of that because I thought the neural network uh, the brain as a neural network is a little bit like that. Our neural, you know, human brain has roughly 100 billion neurons. And uh, the neurons are not like molecules. Uh, neurons are living things. So the living things, at the very least, have a survival purpose, have a survival goal. So they are goal-driven. Uh, and so... Even at the individual neuron level, you believe there, are, there is something different. It's not just a passive entity. Right, even at the, uh, any, any living thing, mm. even the simplest of living thing, which is a cell, mm. uh, is, 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 is certainly, it's, it's made of molecules, obviously, and then there are reactions taking mm. place, there are structures, molecular structures, and so on. Uh, so they are, they are made up of molecules, but they are different from molecules as an entity. Mm. So they pursue simple goals, like mm. survival, but they are not, overtly or intentionally goal-driven like people are. Mm. So they are somewhere in the spectrum between molecules and people. And so what would StatMec look like? And mm. that is the problem I was thinking about, even though that was not my thesis area. And it so happened at that time, uh, this was 1982, um, John Hopfield visited Cornell to deliver a seminar in physics on his recent work on uh, neural networks. Uh, now we call them Hopfield uh, networks, and 
And for that work, he got half of the Nobel Prize uh, last year, as you know. Sure. And, and the other half went to my postdoc advisor, Jeff Hinton. So when I attended his talk in 82, and uh, his approach made a lot of sense to me. I mean, I still had some questions about the framework, but overall, I thought this was a meaningful way to attack, uh, you know, modeling the brain problem. And so that's how I became interested in AI, and that took me to Hinton and everything. So during the nuclear winter part of these things, that is, nobody was paying any attention, um, I mentioned that it's helpful that if you're you know, half crazy, that uh, you, know, you believe this will finally work out. 